morning, and welcome to biology. I'm Paul Suchecki, and this is my classroom. It's great to see all your smiling faces again. Back for lesson number two. All right, topic for today is the chemistry of life. Have you ever wondered what you're made of? Easy, right? Muscle, skin, bone, stuff like that, you know. Well, what's muscle, skin, and bone made of? Well, muscle, skin, and bone are tissues. Tissues are made of cells. So we're made of cells, right? Awesome, two for two. Yeah, one more question. What are cells made of? Now we're getting small. Well, cells are made of atoms and molecules. So really, you're made of atoms and molecules. And chemistry is the study of atoms and molecules. Now, I know this isn't chemistry class. This is biology. But since you're made of atoms and molecules, you need to know a little bit of chemistry to really understand biology. So let's get started. What are the atoms and molecules that make up living things? You know, the chemistry of life. An element is the simplest form of matter. It can't be broken down by normal chemical means. There are about 92 naturally occurring elements, and they're all listed on the periodic table of elements. Some elements are more important to living things than others. Some elements you can't live without. Some elements you only need trace amounts. And other elements are just harmful to living things. So what are the top 10 most important elements for living things? Ready? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, iron, and magnesium. See Hopkins Cafe, mighty good. What if we took our top 10 and whittled it down to the top four? What are the top four most important elements for living things? Ready? Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, honk, I mean, honk. A compound is two or more elements combined in a fixed ratio. Water is one of the most abundant compounds on Earth, and it's also one of the most important compounds for living things. Water is not listed on the periodic table of elements. That's because water is made of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen to form H2O. Water is a compound and does not contain the element carbon. Compounds that don't contain the element carbon are called inorganic compounds. Water is an inorganic compound. Water is important to living things for a lot of reasons. First of all, water is a very good solvent. It dissolves a lot of things. Sometimes water is called a universal solvent. Now, it doesn't dissolve everything, but it dissolves a lot of things. That's good because all of your metabolic reactions have to occur dissolved in water. If they're not dissolved in water, metabolism won't occur. Second, water has a high heat capacity. That is, it can hold a lot of heat. When water absorbs heat, its temperature goes up only by a little. When water loses heat, its temperature goes down by only a little. So since your body's mostly water, it resists changes in temperature. That's a good thing. Third, when water freezes, it becomes less dense and floats. That's weird. It's not supposed to do that. When things get colder and freeze, they're supposed to become more dense and sink. Well, water has this peculiar property. That's why lakes and other bodies of water freeze from the top down instead of the bottom up. Can you imagine if lakes and things froze from the bottom up? What would that do to living things? Think about it. Fourth, water is adhesive, which means it tends to stick to other things. It's also cohesive, which means it tends to stick to itself. This gives water a property known as capillarity. Capillarity is what allows a paper towel to absorb water upward against the force of gravity. Capillarity is what moves water up the stem of a plant delivering that water to the leaves. Even a redwood tree over 300 feet tall. Now that's amazing. Without liquid water, life as we know it just doesn't exist. Organic compounds contain the element carbon. There are four groups of organic compounds that are important to living things. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Carbohydrates are the main fuel for living things. Glucose is a simple carbohydrate with the formula C6H12O6. Pentose is another simple carbohydrate with the formula C5H10O5. Notice it follows the same basic pattern as glucose. For every one carbon, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. CH2O, carbohydrate. Glucose and pentose are called monosaccharides because they're single sugar units. Mono means one, saccharide means sugar. Monosaccharide, one sugar unit. This is the structural formula for glucose. Notice it forms kind of a ring structure, almost like a hexagon. So we use a hexagon to represent a glucose molecule. This is the structural formula for pentose. Notice it also forms a ring structure 
but since it's only got five carbons, it forms a pentagon. So we use a pentagon to represent a pentose molecule. Notice on one side of the ring, there's an H attached, and on the other side of the ring, there's an OH. Just point it out, that's all. A disaccharide is formed when two monosaccharides are joined together. It's almost like they're holding hands. Di means two, saccharide means sugar, disaccharide, two sugar units. Sucrose is a disaccharide. It has the chemical formula C12H22O11. See? We take two monosaccharides, C6H12O6 plus C6H12O6, and we join them together and we get a disaccharide, C12H22O11. Easy. I know what you're thinking. Suchecki doesn't know how to add. Shouldn't it be C12H24O12? It's almost like it's missing two hydrogens and one oxygen. That's a water. It's missing a water. When you join two monosaccharides together to get a disaccharide, a water molecule comes out. We call this dehydration synthesis. Synthesis means to put together. So we're putting together two monosaccharides and getting a disaccharide. That's the synthesis part. When we do that, water falls out. That's the dehydration part. Get it? Dehydration synthesis. We can join a third monosaccharide, or a fourth, or a fifth. Or we can form a long chain of monosaccharides, called a polysaccharide. A polysaccharide is a complex carbohydrate formed of many monosaccharides joined together in a long chain. Poly means many. Saccharide means sugar. Polysaccharide, many sugar units. Starch is a polysaccharide made by plants when they combine sugar units into long chains. They can store the starch for later. It takes an enzyme to form the bond between the sugar units. Another enzyme can break the bonds between sugar units and turn it back into glucose. Or animals can eat the starch and break it down into sugar. Plants also produce a polysaccharide called cellulose. They use the cellulose to form their cell walls. Even though cellulose is a polysaccharide made of many sugar units, the chemical bond that holds the cellulose together is different from the chemical bond that holds starch together. We have the enzyme to break down starch, but we don't have the enzyme to break down cellulose. Some animals do, like termites. Well, actually, the termite doesn't have the enzyme to break down cellulose. The termite has a little protist living in its intestines. Wait a minute. Termites have intestines? Yeah. So termites eat wood, which is mostly cellulose, and the little protists that live in their intestines break the cellulose into glucose, and the termite could use that for fuel. Termites aren't the only animals that have these protists in their intestines. Most herbivores, like horses and cows and rabbits, also have these protists living in their intestines. So they can eat grass and other cellulose material, break it down into glucose, and use it for fuel. Since we don't have those enzymes, we can eat the cellulose, but it just passes through our intestine basically undigested. But that's okay, because it's a good form of roughage that helps clean out our intestines. Keeps things moving, if you know what I mean. Can you think of some foods that are high in carbohydrate? How about bread, and pasta, and rice, and potatoes? All fruits and vegetables are high in carbohydrates. So if vegetarians eat vegetables, what do humanitarians eat? The second group of organic compounds that are important for living things are the lipids. Lipids are fats, oils, and waxes. Sometimes lipids have a bad reputation, but you really can't live without them. For example, do you have oil in your skin? Is there oil in your hair? Is that good or bad? What if you had too much oil in your skin? Too much oil in your hair? I guess you'd look a little greasy. But what if you had no oil in your skin and no oil in your hair? That would probably be worse. A person should have a healthy amount of lipid on their body. You should talk to a doctor or a nutritionist to determine how much lipid on your body is actually healthy for you. Too much body fat can lead to obesity and a whole host of other health problems. But too little body fat can just be dangerously unhealthy. Some people with eating disorders develop a condition known as anorexia nervosa, where their body fat drops to a dangerously low level. Again, you have to have a healthy amount of fat on your body. Too much is bad, but too little is probably worse. Lipids are very important. We all have some lipid under our skin. It cushions us and keeps us warm in the wintertime. All of our cell membranes are made of lipid, and we've got a lot of cell membranes. 
Hormones are special lipids that your body produces that help control and regulate various functions in your body. Without the right amount of lipid in your body, your body has a hard time producing these hormones. I heard that about 70% of your brain is made of fat. So if somebody calls you a fathead, they're right. Can you think of any foods that are high in lipids? How about oil and grease, butter, animal fat? Some lipids are actually good for you, like peanut oil, if you're not allergic to it. Some fish oils are good for you. Lipids are made of smaller units or building blocks called fatty acids. This is a fatty acid. It's a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached on all sides. But on one end, there's a carboxylic acid group. If we join three fatty acids to a glycerol molecule, we get a triglyceride. Triglyceride is a common way for your body to transport lipid in your blood. If one of the fatty acids of a triglyceride is removed and replaced by a phosphate group, we get a phospholipid. This is a phospholipid. Cell membranes are made of phospholipids. Phospholipids are crazy molecules. It's like they have a split personality. Half of the molecule is hydrophobic, and the other half of the molecule is hydrophilic. The word hydrophobic means water fear, and hydrophobic molecules don't mix well with water. Vegetable oil is hydrophobic. Have you ever seen what happens when you mix vegetable oil with water? They don't mix. That's because the oil is very hydrophobic. So if vegetable oil comes from vegetables, where does baby oil come from? The word hydrophilic means water loving, and hydrophilic molecules do mix well with water. Phospholipids are partly hydrophobic and partly hydrophilic. The fatty acid parts are hydrophobic, and they don't dissolve well in water. The phosphate part is hydrophilic, and it does dissolve well in water. So when you put a phospholipid in water, part of the molecule dissolves and part of the molecule doesn't. That's interesting. What do you think that would feel like? It would probably feel slippery, like soap. That's because soap is partly hydrophobic and partly hydrophilic. When you put a whole bunch of these phospholipids in water, they form what's known as a micelle droplet. As you add more phospholipid to the micelle droplet, it starts to flatten out and it forms a membrane. This is the beginning of a cell membrane. Notice there are two layers of lipids. We call this a lipid bilayer. The only thing missing in this membrane are membrane proteins. Speaking of proteins, the third group of organic compounds important to living things are the proteins. There are thousands of different proteins in your body, each with a specific function. But basically, we can put all these proteins into two categories, structural proteins and regulatory proteins. Structural proteins make up the structures of your body, like hair, muscle, fingernails, toenails, cartilage, you know, things like that. Regulatory proteins are involved in chemical reactions. The regulatory proteins in your body that control your chemical reactions are called enzymes. Each chemical reaction requires a different enzyme. Enzymes are very specific. Since there are thousands of different chemical reactions in your body, there are thousands of different enzymes. Proteins are made of smaller building blocks called amino acids. There are about 23 different amino acids that make up thousands of different proteins in your body. This is an amino acid. It's got a carbon atom in the middle. On one side, there's a carboxylic acid group, C, double O, H. On the other side, there's an amine group, NH2. An amine on one side, an acid on the other side. Amine, acid, amino acid. The third part of the amino acid is the R group, represented by the letter R. The R group could be just about anything. It could be a simple hydrogen atom, or it could be a complex functional group, like this one. There are at least 23 different amino acids. What makes each amino acid different is the R group. Each different amino acid has a different R group, giving each amino acid different properties. We get our amino acids from the foods we eat. Last night, I ate a cow. Well, I didn't eat the whole cow. I just ate part of the cow. Well, the part of the cow that I ate was mostly protein. And my body is breaking the cow proteins down into individual amino acids. Then my body's gonna take these amino acids that came from a cow and build them back up into my proteins. Can you think of some foods that are high in protein? How about meat, any kind of meat? Whether it comes from a cow, a chicken, a pig, a fish, eggs are high in protein. A group of plants called the legumes are high in protein. Legumes are things like beans, peanuts, and peas. Legumes are one of the few plant groups that are high in protein. Your best source of protein is probably meat. But if you don't like to eat meat, you should eat lots of legumes. When your body takes two amino acids and links them together, we get a dipeptide. 
What holds a dipeptide together is a peptide bond. Notice when we join two amino acids, a water molecule falls out. Remember dehydration synthesis? We can link more amino acids together, forming a chain called a polypeptide. The sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide is critical. What makes one protein different from another is the order that the amino acids go in. Let's say we put the amino acids in this order. We get a protein. But if we rearrange those amino acids into a different order, we get a different protein. What dictates the order that the amino acids go in? That's the job of your DNA. Your DNA holds the instructions on how to make every protein in your body. Which brings us to our fourth group of organic compounds important to living things, the nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA store and transfer genetic information. But DNA also controls the production of proteins. A segment of DNA that holds the information for one protein is called a gene. Nucleic acids like DNA and RNA are made of smaller building blocks called nucleotides. When you put a whole bunch of nucleotides together, you get a nucleic acid. DNA is a double helix. That is, two strands of nucleotides side by side, twisted together. It looks kind of like a spiral staircase or a twisted ladder. When it comes to DNA, there's a lot to talk about. So we're going to devote a whole chapter to nucleic acids later on. So I'm just going to have to leave it there for now. My mother always said, you are what you eat. In other words, the atoms and molecules that make you up come from the foods that you eat, the liquids that you drink, and the air that you breathe. And not all foods are created equal. You gotta get the right atoms and molecules. If you do, I think you can expect to live a longer and healthier life. So speaking of that, I wish you a longer and healthier life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the chemistry of life. Till next time, don't get lost. I'll see you later.